Neustadt Squid. This is part two of a four video series on the differences between UMAP, TSNE and PCA. So if you haven't yet, watch my previous video on PCA. Today we will be covering part two, TSNE easily explained. So if you're ready, let's dive in. Before we dive into TSNE, let's go over a few key concepts. In part one, we introduced our example dataset, a single cell dataset with the gene expression of 10,000 genes across 50,000 cells. We also explained the need to visualize this dataset in a plot. For example, to identify clusters of cells that group together because they have similar gene expression profiles. In other words, they are cells from the same cell type or cell identity. Now, to do that, we introduce the concept of dimensionality reduction, by which we convert a multidimensional data set with many thousands of genes into two variables we can plot. Obviously, we, when we reduce the number of dimensions, we're going to lose information, but the idea is to preserve as much of the data set's structure and characteristics as possible. There are many dimensionality reduction algorithms that do just that, and today we'll be talking about one of them, TSNE, or T-Distributed Stochastic Neighbor Embedding. In essence, TSNE transforms each high dimensional object, in this case, each cell, which has many genes, to a two dimensional point, sometimes three, in such a way that when we plot it, cells with similar gene profiles will be assigned to nearby points and cells with very different gene profiles will have distant coordinates. In other words, TSNE will keep similar cells close together and push cells that are very different further apart. Great, that's exactly what we want. So how does TSNE do that? I'll give you a very high level explanation of the maths involved in this transformation. First, we measure pairwise similarities. So TSNE calculates how similar each pair of cells is to each other. It does this by looking at the distance between them, often using a method like a Gaussian or normal distribution. The idea is that if two cells have very similar gene expression profiles, they should have a high similarity score. And if they're far apart, the similarity score should be low. Next, TSNE creates probabilities. So the similarities we talked about are turned into probabilities. Think of it as a likelihood that two cells are close neighbors. The closer two points are, the higher the probability that they are neighbors. Next, TSNE maps these probabilities into lower dimensions. So it creates a new 2D space and tries to position the data points there. The goal is to place points so that similar cells in the original high dimensional space are still close together in this new two dimensional space and the similar cells are further apart. And finally, TSNE optimizes the layout. This is where the stochastic part comes in. TSNE uses a technique called gradient descent, which is a way of adjusting the positions of the points in the lower dimensional space step by step, trying to make the distribution of similarities in the lower space match the original distribution as closely as possible. The key math involves probabilities and optimization, but the goal is to create a map that reflects the relationships between the cells as closely as possible, just in fewer dimensions. In summary, TSNE is excellent for visualizing complex high dimensional data in two or three dimensions. For example, if we want to see clusters of cells with similar gene expression profiles, but it is computationally expensive and sensitive to hyperparameters, meaning the plot you get at the end depends on the perplexity you set. Wait a minute, hyperparameters? The main hyperparameter I'm talking about is the perplexity, which controls how the algorithm balances local versus global relationships in the data. 
perplexity is related to how many neighbours each point is considering when building its similarity map. Let's clarify that. When we set perplexity to a low value, we only consider a few neighbours when checking similarity, so the algorithm focuses more on local relationships. This means it will be sensitive to small differences between cells and will try to preserve tight clusters of cells that have very similar gene expression profiles. When we set perplexity to a high value, the algorithm starts to consider a large number of neighbouring cells when calculating similarity. This makes it better at capturing global relationships, like how different cell types, for example neurons, epithelial cells, immune cells, are distributed across the dataset. The individual clusters of cells might be less tightly packed, but the overall arrangement of cell types is probably clearer. The immune cells might form a cluster and the epithelial cells might form another, even if there's some variability in gene expression within each group. In our single cell or in a seq data, setting a low perplexity would help us visualize small differences between immune cell types, for example um, TCD4 positive cells and TCD8 positive cells, but it might not preserve the large scale organization between cell types like immune cells versus non-immune cells, and these might appear more mixed. So TSNE does require a bit of optimization to find the right perplexity to visualize your dataset. Okay, so it's time to say goodbye to TSNE and welcome UMAP. In my next video, we will cover UMAP and why it's one of the most popular dimensionality reduction algorithms. Squid-tastic. If you like this video or have any ideas on new topics you'd like me to post about, leave me a comment down below. I really appreciate any kind of support and I'm always looking for new topics to dive into. Remember to subscribe if you don't want to miss any more videos from me. Have a squid-tastic day and see you in the next one.